encouragements, perhaps some warnings as well. Now, just because they come last in the letter doesn't mean that they don't really matter that much or they're just afterthoughts. It's better to think of them as concentrated, condensed instruction, keeping words to a minimum for maximum impact. Summing up these six verses here, if you like a title, who and how we should love. Who and how we should love. And so it starts there in verse one. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Keep on loving each other as brothers. We should love each other as brothers, as family. And when it says each other, that means people in the church, those in the church who are born again. And it also says, keep on loving each other. Do you notice that? That is an encouragement in itself. Because if they're to keep on, that means they're doing it already. That's good news, isn't it? And it means they're obeying that command of the Lord. Remember when the Lord Jesus said, John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you. And by this, all men, all people will know that you are my disciples. And they are obeying that. It's very important, isn't it? They are obeying that new command of Jesus. That it would be the hallmark of Christ's disciples. An identifier, if you like, a badge, which shows that we are truly his. And just to add some application to that, how are we doing at this? How are we doing at loving each other as brothers? How are you loving those who love Jesus? Verse 2, a bit of a curious one, this. I know a, a, a friend of mine from uh, Harold Hill, he used to, he wasn't yet a Christian, he used to find great fascination with this fascination with this verse. Verse 2 of Hebrews 13, do not forget to entertain strangers. For by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Now, it sounds quite mysterious, doesn't it? Quite exciting. I'm thinking perhaps immediately of what happened in Genesis 18 last week, didn't we? When we have the Lord and two angels who are there eating a meal that Abraham has prepared. Um, I'm not sure of other times that it's happened. Um, but there... In this verse, it says, do not forget to entertain strangers. So it's showing love to strangers. Who and how to love. We're to love each other as brothers. And we're to show love to strangers. Now for a practical application of this, not necessarily from my life, but towards me, I've got a story that goes back some years. Um, I was backpacking uh, around Europe with a friend and uh, we planned out all our stops that day. And unfortunately, even though it was Austria, and you think everything runs on clockwork, the train was delayed. And that means that that meant that we couldn't catch the last train that went in the course of that with a boat across the lake uh, to get to where we were supposed to be going. Uh, and so we were stuck in this town, and we're thinking, what do we do now? Because we've got a tent. There's no campsite here, and uh, we were a bit stuck, so we just walked down the street and we said, well, let's pray. So I turned around and prayed, and we looked up, and uh, this man, he was in his 60s, and his wife were just walking back, and it was dusk at this time, it was August, and it was just dusk, so the light was fading, and uh, they were walking back from somewhere, and they looked like locals. And um, <coughs> it was clear they only spoke German, but they hardly spoke English <coughs> at all. And we tried to do some sort of hand signals, so we got the tent in, uh, and this car came up. And we said, good luck, because we knew it in German. And then we tried to make some hand gestures to them. And we tried to explain some more, but we weren't really sure what was going through. Spoke to his wife again. And then he beckoned with his hand. And he looked 
Okay. Is it going to take us to campsite or something like that? Show us where to go? Here we go. And then he came to a, a, a small block of flats. They were on his flats. And I thought, oh, great. We can camp in the garden here. Oh, brilliant. Excellent. No. He goes in, goes up, I think he lived on the first floor. And uh, back he was in. And then he showed us into his little humble flat, and um, it was, I guess it was like a bed set in. He put it all out. Really? Wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then, back he was in. And uh, his wife came to the kitchen, and his wife had made this big fruit roll thing. Fruit roll. Chopped off three, four, five slices. Not for you. Well, he didn't say for you. Just in his hand again. Really? Uh, and he treated like royalty. You know, he said for everything they had. Even when he saw my camera, he even, he even would open a drawer and show me his camera, his pride and joy. Amazing, you trust him. So, we went to bed, thanking God for his answer. Got up the next morning, that same fruit loaf came out again. <laughs> there you go. And he fed us. It didn't even end there. When we showed him the train timetable, where we wanted to go, he actually took us down to the station. He seemed to know the train driver as well. And, um, and he got us up on, uh, set on the train. And we didn't even go there now. So there was a place in Austria called Achtan Kuchheim. So we just know, we just speak of them as Mr. and Mrs. Achtan Kuchheim. So, and there is an example, I know they weren't necessarily Christians, we don't know, there's an example of this, and we, we're not necessarily angels either, uh, but uh, don't forget to entertain strangers. You know, the wonderful example there of those people um, back then. But we should love, show love to strangers, we don't know. Verse 3, remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are ill-treated as if you yourselves were suffering. Show love and concern for Christians in prison and those going through persecution. Another way of showing love. Again, we're on our, 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 our mist, if you like. That's, that sounds a bit dry. But we're... we're Noting down the people and groups who should we love? We should love each other as brothers. We should we can show love to strangers. We should show love and concern for those Christians in prison going through persecution. And this is a particularly interesting instruction in our day in the 21st century because we get so much information about Christians who are suffering. You might hang up the Barnabas uh, Fund um, prayer diary. There's obviously a prayer diary from every Christian organisation you can think of, whether it's Christian Aviation Fellowship or Open Doors or Reefs International, and it goes on and on. And there could be so many different people that we're praying for. We've got reports from all over the world regarding imprisoned and suffering Christians. And here is the Lord clearly telling us we need to be praying for them, we need to bring them up in prayer, presenting their needs to the Father. So, you know, we believe that God has orchestrated all this, that we are given this so that we can pray, that we're given that information, we can pray with intelligence as we say. Then it comes to verse 4. Marriage should be honoured by all. And the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Who and how we should love. We should love our own family. I mean, don't we? Love everyone else enough to keep our hands to ourselves. So that must be a, a, a type of love in doing. 
honours God and giving them, whoever they are, anybody else who's not our spouse, their ability to be the people that they have been called to be by God. I wasn't around for most of it, but in the 60s, you know, we have the sexual revolution, much trumpeted, summer of love, 1967, I believe. Free love, spoken of as free love, but no, it wasn't at all. Nothing, nothing of the sort. And we need to remember that what God has written is never out of date. What he's written here is for all time. It is beautiful and wonderful. And so just because the 1960s people wanted to start off a revolution, as they said, something different does not tear out the truth of the Bible. We need to keep to it. This, this is God's definition of love, and therefore the only correct definition. Marriage should be honoured by all. And the marriage bed kept pure, for God would judge the adulterer and all the sexual immoral. And sometimes we need the threat of judgment over us not to do something, but how much better it is when we are motivated to do what's right because of wanting to honour God. So it's not just a, don't do this or this will happen to you, but rather that we do it because we know that is the best way for us, the way to honour God and wanting, of course, to honour each other. I hope that the church would look at this verse Verse 13, verse 4. But the church would look at this verse and fully obey it. You know, the devil seems to attack Christian marriage more than anything else in society. The way that you carry women is questioned. Should all men marry? That would be incredible. The whole world would, but we should not seek to accept those who don't love the Lord as their Lord to live as his people. Those of us who are his people, we should show the world and the rest of the church what kind of behaviour honours him. We read recently, love will endure when you keep it pure. Love will endure when you keep it pure. I hope it's not about keeping marriage or thing. We said that success in marriage is more than finding the right person. It's becoming the right person, giving ourselves first to Christ and then to each other. I said at the beginning of the service, didn't I? In Psalm 18, I love you, my Lord, my strength. We put God first. We give ourselves first to Christ and then to each other. And this is the pattern.
when we are longing for money and the things that money buys, and we're discontent with what we have, that is not the place to be, because spiritually, we'll be off track. No. God has said, He has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. We're taking His promise. We believe Him. He's better than all the things that money buys. Better than having money. Better than the security of having loads of money. That's what it's meant. Will I flee from the love of money and be content with what we have? For his love is there. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So instead of building our money or contentment, fleeing the things that money buys, we're building our lives on the faithfulness of God. Building on his promise. And he says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. His claim, his promise, and he is the true treasure that we find in love. And so, he says, just ending this section now, in these six verses, and so we say, with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? What can man do to me? So we think about the verses in Luke chapter 12. Uh, Jesus is speaking and he says, Don't fear man who can kill the body and after that can do no more. But fear him who has the power to put even your soul into hell. In other words, if everything is good between us and God, we have have a, a clear account. We've had our sin dealt with. Then, what have we got to fear? What can man do to me? The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. So we keep quoting there from the Psalms. Two thousand years old. writing it down. We pray, Lord, that we would be given an understanding of who you want us to be as people. And indeed, the will and the courage to put it into action. We pray that we would love each other as brothers. We pray that we would love even the stranger. We pray that we would show love to those who are in prison and suffering for all the sake the name of the Lord Jesus. We pray that we would love our spouses. We pray that we would love you most of all, Lord. More, much more than money or the things that money buys. May you truly be our treasure. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.